Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. You talked about the importance of low, low mean glucose, low variability, and lower and fewer glucose peaks. But can you talk generally about how you might address these things if they get out of whack? Are there things you look for, like exercise habits, dietary approaches, stress level, et cetera? Yep. I, I mean, I think of them, I think of all, I think of those being like, you have basically five tools that you can use to manipulate glucose, um, nutrition, exercise, uh, management of stress, which is, is, is a, a lot of that is about cortisol, but not just cortisol, uh, sleep, and then medications slash supplements. So, um, in, in my view, I think it always makes sense to start with the two most powerful levers, which are nutrition and exercise. And, you know, obviously everyone's going to be starting from a different place. So they're going to have some people that are starting from a place of, you know, they're quite insulin sensitive to begin with. Um, and w you sort of use the CGM to, to kind of push the boundaries a little bit to tell you, um, what is your carbohydrate tolerance? Cause you know, two people can, or a given person can have two totally different carbohydrate tolerances depending on their activity level. So when I was cycling a lot, which is the last thing that I did kind of quasi seriously, um, I mean, I was easily consuming 600 calories of, uh, sorry, 600 grams of carbohydrates a day. Um, mm. and I mean, no issues maintaining normal glucose homeostasis. Um, if today I were to consume 600 grams of carbohydrates a day, and just to put that in perspective, that's 2,400 calories of carbs a day. Okay. Like that's, that's about what the average person is eating in total intake per day. Um, but if I were to consume 2,400 calories of carbohydrates today, I don't suspect my glucose would look nearly as good as it did then. And that's cause you know, I used to be exercising nearly 28 hours a week and now I'm exercising maybe 10 hours a week. Um, so, um, again, th you're just going to sort of basically tweak these interventions, um, based on your starting point and your, and your aspiration. Um, the reason I bring up sleep is I don't think it can be overlooked. Um, and I think that the, the data for poor sleep and insulin resistance are actually quite strong. I think we've talked about this many times, even I, 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 um, I, I think we've spoken about this on several podcasts, but you know, the, the even short term bouts of sleep deprivation, like two weeks of four hours of sleep deprivation per night result in about a 50% reduction in glucose disposal, which of course would result in hyperglycemia. So, um, yeah, you just got to pay attention to all of these things. Yeah. And that, I think the sleep is particularly insidious because you may have that insulin resistance. You also have that whatever you call it, sleep deprivation, you're tired and fatigued. And then you look at, you know, what are your exercise habits? What is your dietary approach? What is your stress level? And I imagine that it's probably harder to get in that, that workout, at least, you know, even if you do get into the gym, I wonder if it's at the same intensity that you would normally do. And I don't know from past experience, if I was sleep deprived, let's say I was doing like a ketogenic diet and I was like, if I were to, you know, make a mistake and go off of it, you know, N equals one, but I was highly, highly more likely to, you know, dig into the Hagen dazs whatever the case is, if I did, if I, if I was sleep deprived and probably more likely to be stressed out too, as well without the sleep. So I think a lot of them kind of feed into each other.